please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Susan Cutter. Thank you and good evening. Can you hear me all right? Okay. It's very nice to be back in California. I grew up in Northern California, uh, so it's always fun to come home to the state. Um, hopefully, uh, I haven't picked up too much of a Southern accent, but every now and then, a you all or y'all comes out. So bear with me. Um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight to talk to you about a topic that has been my life and my passion for more than about 35 years, and that is the topic of hazards and disasters. We know that no one is immune from hazards and no place is safe from natural disasters. We know that there is increasing exposure. That is, that there's more infrastructure and people that are living in harm's way now than ever before. At the same time, our infrastructure is aging. The American Society of Civil Engineers rates our infrastructure as a D. Uh, in terms of its ability to regenerate uh, and repair itself. You all know the roads are crumbling, the bridges are crumbling, perhaps not in Orange County as much as places in the East, but nevertheless, aging infrastructure is a big problem in this country. We know that we have an aging population. Uh, we know that people move. We know that there are declining federal budgets and in a zero-sum game, uh, sometimes there's not enough resources for the things that uh, may seem far away in time, like a disaster, when you have critical needs like schools uh, and police and fire that need funding. We know that there is an increase in the severity of climate-related events, and this all leads to a situation where we also see that there's a, quite a different landscape of roles and responsibilities of people who have disaster management as part of their portfolio. Most of the infrastructure in this uh, nation is privately owned, and it's up to the private owners of that infrastructure to manage the risks. We know that there are federal, state, and local entities that have responsibilities for some forms of management, whether it's laws, regulation, zoning is a, is a local phenomena. We know that the players include interest groups. It includes uh, industry groups as well, and of course, science and research. And it involves all of you because all of you are risk managers as well. You manage risks for yourself. You manage risks for your household. So the problem we have is that the number of federal disaster declarations is rising. There have been 18 so far in 2014. For those of you that are unaware of this, these presidential disaster declarations uh, are given when there is a disaster that overwhelms the capacity of a local area or a state to adequately respond to that. And this disaster declaration then frees up federal resources that come in to help the local area respond to and recover from that disaster. Going back to 1980 up to present, uh, NOAA has been counting weather-related disasters that cause more than a billion dollars uh, for each event. And we've had 151 of those so-called billion-dollar disaster events. And if you add up the losses of all of these events, we're looking at about a trillion dollars 
in terms of losses from natural hazards. And the most recent estimate is 2012, and we're looking at $107 billion in losses in the United States. These losses are occurring locally. They are occurring at a time when communities are facing incredibly difficult circumstances in terms of fiscal resources, in terms of social and environmental and cultural choices about the best way to secure the livelihoods of members in that community and to maintain the quality of life in that community. What we see is many people don't realize that the government is spending a lot more on disaster relief than anybody thought. What this means is they're paying money after the fact. They are not putting money into reducing the impact of disasters. They're putting money into picking up the pieces afterward. So what we have is a disaster loss escalator. And that is that these losses are increasing over time. And they're increasing even when you normalize for population increases and increases in wealth. Uh, if we look at the numbers here by the individual decades, you can see uh, in the 1960s, the average annual loss was $4.7 billion. And in the 2000s, it was up to $23.6 billion. And thus far, in the 2010s, we're at $30 billion, but that's going to go up because we're only at 2014, and we have six more years to go. If you look at the average annual per capita loss, this one blew me away. Uh, in the 1960s, it was $24.80 that was spent by the federal government on disasters per person, and by the 2000s, it's up to 80 uh, dollars and ten cents. So we've got this huge problem of disasters. And the question that I want to talk to you tonight about is how do we reverse this loss escalator? How do we get losses to decrease rather than continue on the up escalator and increase? These questions and these problems prompted eight federal agencies to come to the National Academies and ask them to put together a study looking at uh, disaster resilience. What could the nation do to reverse these trends? This was a unique opportunity because rarely do eight federal agencies agree on anything let alone agree to fund a study for the National Academies. Uh, our work began in September of 2010, and it concluded uh, in August of 2012 with the release of the report, uh, Disaster Resilience. And I had the privilege to chair this committee. We had some simple tasks. The first was, well, what do you mean by national resilience? What are the issues? We know we need to do something. We're just not sure what it is or what we should do about it. The federal government also wanted to know about measures and baseline conditions that would be important for monitoring progress towards resilience. The agencies wanted to know what does the science community know about resilience? Where are some of the gaps in our knowledge? Where are some of the gaps in our practice? And what can you, National Academies, tell us about what kinds of approaches we need to take to elevate the conversation about disaster resilience in the United States? 
The team was a multidisciplinary team because resilience is a multidisciplinary concept. We had people who were engineers, who were natural scientists, who were social scientists, the list is here. Uh, we had members from uh, the private sector, and we had members from the public sector, uh, one of whom, Ellis Stanley, used to be head of emergency services for the city of Los Angeles. Our first task was to define resilience. And I'm showing you a picture here of places that are, in fact, not resilient. All right? Do I have to point it out for you? Right here. This is South Jersey, southern New Jersey. Uh, these houses are built on sand, and sand moves. Sand doesn't stay put, even though you have a structure here that is trying to keep the sand in place, those houses are no longer there, all right? This photograph was taken in the 1970s, uh, and those places are seriously long gone. Um, for the purposes of this report, uh, the committee decided to take a very, very broad definition of resilience as the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt, not only to actual events, but to potential adverse events. With this definition, basically anything falls under the umbrella of resilience. Now, when we speak of resilience, we can talk about it at various levels. We can talk about it as individual resilient. That is, how resilient are you as an individual? Obviously, this depends on your age, your health capacity, your genetic uh, makeup, whether or not you have any bad habits, uh, et cetera. We can look at individual structures, like individual houses, for example. Uh, examples uh, of these are this house, this person, this is in coastal Texas. And I have to give this person credit. You know, they thought they were living in a storm surge area, so they elevated the mobile home, but they forgot that they're also in a high wind environment, <laughs> and they've actually increased their risk by elevating the mobile home. Um, Similarly, we have this structure here. This is on Sullivan's Island in South Carolina. And this is actually a fairly wind-resistant structure. Uh, and uh, from a, a building perspective, it's actually a hurricane-resistant house. I'm not sure how many people would actually want to live there. Um, but it's a very interesting uh, feature architecturally. We can talk about different groups. Uh, we can talk about social groups, for example. We can talk about different sectors, like the water sector, the energy sector, in terms of, of a focus on resilience. And we can talk about different kinds of systems, like ecosystems here, or agricultural systems, or infrastructure systems, which is the, the levees uh, and the flood barriers that uh, go along the Mississippi uh, River in places like Cairo, Illinois. So when we talk about resilience and we look at it from the perspective of communities, we're really talking about a system of systems. Communities are systems that integrate natural environment, industry, the social environment, the political environment, communications. Cities operate as a system of systems in the same way that the human body is a system of systems. That when you diagnose one part of the human systems, for example, um, your uh, heart systems, you go in and you diagnose that problem because it may impair other systems that will make you sick. In the same way, we can think of communities then 
in a very similar vein. And it's a very nice analogy when you think about communities as this system of systems, because then we can start to parse out and say, OK, what do we need to do to make business more resilient in our community? What do we need to do to make the infrastructure more resilient in our community? So the big question we have is, how can we enhance the nation's resilience to disasters for each one of these systems in communities and also from the national level? The first and the most important uh, contribution that this committee made was that we needed, as a nation, to establish a culture of resilience. We don't have it. We did have it during the Second World War, where everyone pulled together. There was a common theme. Everyone went to work. Men went overseas to fight. Women went into factories. Uh, people did what was necessary to keep the nation going. We don't have that culture of resilience, and it is our feeling that the first step in strengthening the nation's resilience is to establish this culture. And this culture requires a full and clear commitment uh, to this concept of disaster resilience by the federal government. But it's not just the federal government. It's also at the local level as well. Because all disasters are local. Their impacts are felt locally. And you have to start at home. And we need both a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. Well, what are the ingredients for building this culture of resilience? First and foremost, it takes leadership. And in some quarters, leadership is not there. It also takes a political will. And in some quarters, that political will is not there. It takes governmental engagement in risk reduction. And it's not just federal government engagement. It's state government engagement and tribal government engagement and local government engagement. It requires linkages between civil society, between the public sector, and private interests. Public and private need to be on the same page, not opposing one another. It requires us to be interested in and engaged in peer-to-peer -peer learning, that is, learning from each other, learning what works, learning what doesn't work. How many times have we repeated these lessons, we've, we've quote, learned lessons, but we haven't really learned them because we repeat those failures over and over again. And it requires thinking about incorporating resilience into everyday life, not just thinking about disasters, but putting it into planning and all kinds of development efforts. So if we can establish this culture of resilience, then we think there are five steps that would be very helpful uh, in moving us forward. Um, and I'll go through each one. The first one is building local capacity. We know that strong resilience begins with local capacity. As part of our efforts on this committee, we went to visit places that had experienced disasters. We went to New Orleans. Uh, and talk to people after Hurricane Katrina. We also did that along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We went to Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, Iowa, who had experienced significant floods. And we came to Southern California to talk to people uh, here in Irvine about earthquakes, about wildfires. We found in each instance that it starts at the local level, that the community has to be engaged in disaster planning, that the, there needs to be promotion of the risks, 
Do people know where they live? Do they know the risks that they face? Do they know they're living on a fault? Do they know they're living in a fire-prone region? It requires the communities to be familiar with uh, helping families prepare for disasters and helping special needs populations who may need assistance during times of disasters. And it requires local communities to develop and adopt land use practices that try to keep people out of harm's way and to enforce building codes. Because oftentimes there are building codes in place that can help prevent uh, faulty buildings um, and less, let's say, fire resistant or earthquake resistant, but those building codes are not enforced. And that enforcement is clearly a local matter. The second step is to identify and assess the disaster risks. Um, we know that there are a variety of tools that can be used to manage the risks once they're identified. And we know that you need to take as many different kinds of tools as you have available in your toolkit. A one-size-fits-all strategy is not going to work because each community has a different set of risks and a different set of potential impacts. And so you need to develop a suite of alternatives that work best for the communities. And these can be things such as structural measures like levees and dams, the, the big ticket items, or it could be uh, building natural defenses or having better insurance for people to facilitate their recovery. Uh, at the local level, we need communities to be proactive in their investments in risk reduction. Uh, and this is an example from Hurricane Sandy in Monmouth Beach, uh, New Jersey, where these are side-by-side -side houses, and this homeowner is being proactive by elevating the structure so they can rebuild. And the neighbor is just going to leave the structure as is. The next time that there's a flood, this person's going to be much better off than this person here. And so this proactive behavior, this was done before there was any requirement to elevate your house, is what we need to, um, to move resilience forward at the local level. And something that has been advocated for a long time is to make insurance premiums, particularly those related to flood risk, uh, risk-based. The other important element is making communities take responsibility for their actions. All too often in the rush to development, they will allow building in areas that shouldn't be built, uh, including flood zones. And as a consequence, they're mortgaging the future in many respects because that flood will come. It may not be in the lifetime of the politician that agreed to the development, but that flood will come. The third thing is we need to demonstrate the case for resilience investments. That is, show me that resilience will pay, will make a difference. That for every dollar we invest in resilience, for example, we may save four or five dollars in losses when that event occurs. In order to demonstrate the case for resilience, however, we need to come up with a way of valuing a community's assets. Um, it's very easy to evaluate uh, a house or a business, but what do you do with some of the more intangible assets in a community? We know and we need to demonstrate that these investments will have short and longer term payoffs and more importantly, we need to know what are the patterns of losses that have affected these places 
so that the community can understand in a, in a better way where the impacts are greatest and from what uh, particular threat source uh, and what factors are, are driving that. Is it that there's increased exposure or is the population actually becoming more vulnerable? Unfortunately, uh, the existing loss and inventory data sets in the United States are useful for some purposes, uh, but we, they need improvement. And also, unfortunately, there is no all-hazard loss database for the United States. We simply don't know how much disasters cost this nation on an annual basis. The insurance companies can tell you how much insurance they pay out. FEMA can tell you how much money it pays out, but FEMA's losses are the costs that communities bill for FEMA. We don't really know. There is no systematic loss accounting for disasters. We don't know who's in charge. USGS collects information on earthquakes. NOAA collects information on weather-related events. They don't talk to each other. Okay? FEMA? FEMA sometimes collects data, sometimes it doesn't. FEMA doesn't talk to either one of them in terms of data. And then, of course, you have all the insurers. The insurers don't talk to each other, and they certainly don't talk to federal agencies. So what we have is a problem in that we really don't know what the amount of losses and where it is. Uh, and there are some biases in these databases that these agencies collect. For example, is every hazard represented? Well, no, USGS doesn't have hurricanes. NOAA doesn't have uh, earthquakes or landslides. The losses really aren't comparable over time because uh, many of them have not been adjusted to current dollars. Some of them don't go back very far. Uh, they may go back only to the 1990s. Um, some of the databases have a threshold that they only include the biggest events, not what we might call the normal or everyday event. The flood that comes down Malibu Canyon that's t not big enough to be a presidential disaster declaration but still results in millions of dollars worth of damage. Um, some of them only include insured losses, but not everybody is insured. And so how does that loss get translated into the accounting? Um, an interesting thing from a geographer's perspective is how do they handle the boundaries when boundaries change? Uh, counties in the United States are fairly stable units, although over time, count County boundaries have changed, new counties are created, other counties are merged. How do these databases handle uh, these, these geographies that change? Uh, and we can't really compare the losses because they're derived at very, very differently. Uh, this notion of disaster loss accounting is not unique to the United States. Uh, there is no global uh, disaster loss accounting. Uh, globally, there are different kinds of databases that are out there, but they suffer from the same problems. So in many respects, this loss accounting uh, is important for the U.S., but globally, it's also an issue. If we don't know what our pattern of losses are, how can we know where we started in order to measure progress toward achieving resilience? That is, how do we make this investment uh, decisions? And what we see is there is no consistent basis for measuring resilience that includes all the dimensions that we think should be included. For example, um, the ability of the critical infrastructure to perform in a timely fashion, or uh, measures that include um, social factors related to health or socioeconomic status, or the ability of buildings to withstand a certain level of, of shock, and that's going to, of course, vary by uh, the type of shock 
that it experiences, whether it's an earthquake or a hurricane uh, or a wildfire. And we need to consider the special needs of individuals uh, and groups as we measure this progress. And finally, we need a resilience policy, and we need a vision. And that vision is really going to start uh, at the top, uh, at the federal level, uh, and can be informed by local experience. We need to take the long view of community resilience. It's not something that's going to be solved overnight. This is something that we're going to be in for a long period of time. We know at the federal level that everyone has a small piece of this resilience pie, but they're not talking to one another. There are gaps. There is a lot of overlap. And some of this is related to the legislative authority that sets up these agencies in the first place. Um, but most of it is related to the lack of coordination. And the lack of coordination coupled with the lack of a resilience vision means we don't know where we're going with this resilience thing other than we need to develop a culture of resilience. So the recommendations that the committee came out with was that the government, and this is government at all levels, should support the development of locally-based resilient coalitions. We think starting at the local level is key. And if we can mobilize at the local level, we can then start to exert pressure at the local, the state, and the federal level. We think that the communities need to become committed to and invest in risk management strategies and not put their heads in the sand and simply become proactive and manage what risks are in their community, whether it's related to wildfire risk and putting in ordinances for zero fitting landscaping or making people clear uh, their yards of debris that can, that can be in a fire uh, or keeping people out of floodplains. We need this national disaster database. We'd like to see the federal government develop a resilient scorecard where communities can chart their progress, very similar to the ASCE scorecard, because we think that if Irvine had to show its score and it was compared to Newport Beach and its score, that that would spur some competition among the communities because nobody wants to get a D or an F, right? So we're thinking that this scorecard idea may in fact uh, resonate and develop a little competition uh, among communities to try and improve. We want the federal government and the agencies to incorporate resilience as part of the guiding principle for their activities and that they are promoting and coordinating resilience in their programs and their policies. Well, what has been our progress to date? As I mentioned early on, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, we've had a number of reports and downloads and the typical things that you expect a National Academy report to have done, but uh, our goal was to create actionable recommendations. That is, we want to see action. And so we have been briefing anybody who wants to be briefed. And we've done this for all of our eight sponsors and the people listed on um, this list. And we've been briefing various organizations across the country on this report, and I must say there's an enormous receptivity to the ideas that we've um, put out. We will um, continue in the long run uh, with briefings, conversations, engagements, and we're really focusing now on four specific pillars of resilience. One is this idea of measurement, 
and we will be holding a workshop in Washington with federal agencies sometime in the fall to talk about, well, what should this measurement thing be? We are going out into communities to help build community coalitions. We're continuing talking legislatively about managing and communicating risk and developing new tools and applications for sharing information and data to help build resilient communities. One of the ways in which we have done this is to create a live web page which puts as much of the activity related to resilience as we can keep up with. Um, and interestingly enough, it's just exploded because people are now uh, jumping on this thing. It seems to resonate with uh, local communities. So we try and put up as many examples of things that are going on as we can. And we have developed an exhibit at the Koshland Science Museum in Washington, D.C. that explores some of the data on the economic and human impact of natural disasters. And we'll see how proficient I am with the technology here. And maybe we can show you. All right. This is an interactive website. And we can ask five questions. Where are economic losses the highest? OK. And it's thinking. And this produces a map that shows where those losses are the highest. And so we can scroll over here to California, since this is where we are. And all right, this is showing us Los Angeles County has the highest loss pattern. Ventura, is this cool or what? Yeah? All right, but look at this, the, the Gulf Coast, all right, 146.9 million dollars. This is for the period 1960 to 2013. Okay. So we can see where the losses are highest. What hazards cause the most damage? OK, what do you think in California? Wildfires? Let's see. I can't read that. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Thank you. All right. Maybe wildfires in Southern California. But if you look at the period 1960 all the way through, if we look here in Florida, Hurricanes, okay. Oh, let's go to poor little Iowa. Okay, flooding and drought. Drought's included in here as well. Tornadoes are there, yeah. Where else shall we go? Let's go New Jersey. Wow, look at that. Okay. The deadliest hazard. Anybody want to guess before I click it? Tornadoes? OK. Lightning? Look, when I, when I go over the bubble, it shows on the state. OK? So if we go tornado. If we go flooding, heat, the big bubble in, in heat was a Chicago heat wave that killed about 600 people. Okay. Winter weather, my favorite is lightning though, all right. 
And lightning's interesting because lightning is related to outdoor activity on the golf courses in Florida and also uh, boating. Okay, so let's look at our losses increasing over time. And this shows us uh, where the losses, just a, a time series, and the bars represent uh, certain events. So for example, if we click on this bar, uh, what we have here is, this is Katrina. And if we come down here, th these fatalities on the bottom, losses on the top. Okay, this is Hurricane Andrew. If we go to 1994, if I can find it, 95, 94. This is the Northridge earthquake. And so it shows you not only the losses, tells you a little bit about it up here, gives you a picture, and then shows you approximately where it is. This was developed for uh, a display in the museum where, where students and interested public can come in uh, and look at it. And then you put it all together and you get the profile of your, of your state. If I can find my mouse. Okay. You can get California here. And again, it's just a summary of all that uh, information. So it's a nice way of illustrating the hazards of place and showing what uh, the level of risks are within the community. The vision that we have, as I said, is a long-term vision. And what we'd like to see is a resilient nation in 2030. And the characteristics of that resilient nation are listed here. Uh, one is that the individuals and communities are their own first line of defense, that they can do it by themselves. They can respond to and recover from disasters with very little support from state and federal entities as long as the disaster is not large, uh, simply because they've taken those proactive uh, actions to make themselves more resilient. We see that there's national leadership in 2030, that there are community-led efforts in 2030, that there is site-specific information, so any of you can go on to a website and find out what is the loss in your county. Where are the hazards in your county? How close are you to a uh, fault? How close are you to a flood zone? How close are you to the ocean? We know that zoning ordinances are enacted and enforced and that building codes are improved to make buildings safer. By making buildings safer, you can reduce the losses. And it doesn't take much to make these buildings safer. For example, in high wind environments, it simply takes nailing the roof tiles on a 6-inch basis rather than a 12-inch basis and using slightly longer nails. In fire-prone areas, you don't have shake roofs. You have tile roofs that don't catch fire. These are, these are relatively simple things. Uh, in high wind environments, you have shatterproof glass in your windows. We think in 2030 that a significant portion of disaster recovery should be funded through private capital insurance payouts. And this means that people who live in high-risk areas, like flood zones, pay higher premiums for the privilege of living in those high-risk zones. And those high-risk zones are along rivers, but they're also along the nation's coasts. And right now, the insurance premiums are not risk-based. 
We see that community coalitions have contingency plans to take care of members in that community. And people are no longer isolated. They are working together to make sure that everyone is safe and that this post-disaster recovery will be accelerated because we've invested in infrastructure redundancy and upgrades. And so we're not spending billions and billions of dollars putting infrastructure back to what it was, but we're spending billions and billions of dollars upgrading and making the infrastructure better. And we think with this kind of a vision that a resilient nation in 2030 will have a vibrant and a diverse economy. It will be safer, healthier, and have a better educated citizen citizenry than in previous generations. And with that, I thank you very much.